I don't know a lot about basketball. You know, I'm not a big basketball fan. But it has been interesting to uh, watch uh, you know, amateur sports, collegiate sports uh, in the last month and watch how all of a sudden a, a new issue has arisen in uh, college sports. And that is uh, efforts by college athletes to form a union. You heard about that? They want to form a union. They want to be unionized. And in observing this phenomenon on TV as it's playing itself out, giving us some insight of, um, of uh, this area of big business. Let, make no mistake, you know, college sports is big, big, it's a billion dollar industry. So when union and management, you know, when they get together to work out an agreement or a contract, there are usually three areas that are involved. First of all, there are the contract issues that will be bargained for. You know, salaries, benefits, those type of things are on the table. You know, they're going to be negotiated. Secondly, there are debated issues that maybe will be talked about but can be put you know, on, the, on the burner for future, for future discussion. Maybe how workers are trained or pension contributions, part-time help, things like that. You know, they're not going to be deal killers. We're going to talk about them, but we can kind of, you know, fast forward them or put them into for future negotiations. And then there are what's called the non-negotiables. Non-negotiables. Non-negotiable issues. Those things that are not on the table, those things that will not be discussed, won't even be bargained for. You know, whether it's union representation or accrued benefits, we're not even going to talk about that stuff because they're the non-negotiables. So, some things you can discuss, some things you can change and compromise. And then there are some things that are non-negotiable. There's no wiggle room. There's not even the possibility of discussion. And that reminds me, you know, this whole thing here, the non-negotiable, makes me think of a time when our children were small and uh, you know, Lisa and I were moving around a lot because I was, you know, I was going to school and we were working with different congregations and you know, there was a lot of movement. You know, they were in different schools and so on and so forth. And one day, I forget which one came home and they just came up to us and they said, uh, Mom and Dad, are you guys going to get a divorce? And we're like, what? I guess they must have heard that at school, you know, or they must have seen some kid at school talking about his parents getting a divorce and you know, with all the moving going on and the packing boxes you know, and so on and so forth, they kind of got a little shaky there. They thought maybe that was going to happen to them. Their little buddies, you know, you know, they packed boxes and only dad moved out. Mom stayed. You know, so they were afraid that was going to happen to us. So Lisa and I, of course, we were surprised by the question but we answered them that our lives, you know, our lives might change a lot and we might live in a lot of different places because of daddy's work. But getting divorced was never going to happen because we loved each other, because we were Christians. And in grown-up talk, this was a non-negotiable item in our relationship. You know, we could switch around who does the dishes and who does the yard work and you know, who's, car, who's going to drive which car, you know, those things, you know, those are negotiable. But getting a divorce, breaking up our, our marriage, you know, that, was, that was, I think, probably the first time we ever used the term non-negotiable with our kids. Well, in the world, in this world of shifting values and incredible change, we, in the Lord's church, we need to do two things. First of all, we need to change the things that will help us relate to and serve and communicate the gospel to this generation more effectively. We need to do that, and we are doing that. And secondly, we need to know and we need to maintain those things that are non-negotiable in the church. 
A lot of us, you know, we know it, we know which things are non-negotiable because we've been in the church a long time, many of us have grown up in the church and so on and so forth, you know. but we need to let this generation know what are the things that are non-negotiable. In other words, we need to know the difference between what to change and what not to change because we're living in a season of change. So with this in mind, I'd like to review with you some of the basics, some of the non-negotiables that we as a church hold to regardless of the pressures, regardless of the changes and the challenges that we face in this era. No matter how big or how small we become, here in Choctaw, I'm making it personal, I'm not talking on behalf of the whole church and the whole world, I'm just talking about us here in Choctaw. No matter how big or small we become or who leads us as shepherds or which person's in the pulpit, here are some of the basic non-negotiables that must never be compromised or bargained away for any reason. Now if I were to examine every non-negotiable item in the Bible, it would take days and weeks to cover them all. So I've chosen some key issues that are especially under attack or being considered as negotiable in our day and in our culture, and maybe remind us of the non-negotiables that we here in the Choctaw Church of Christ will not bargain with. The first non-negotiable is the inspiration of the Bible. You know, Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, every scripture is inspired of God. I don't know, you can twist that, you can smash that, you can take that like pizza dough you know, and, and, and do all kinds of stuff with it, you know, but it's very, very difficult to make that sentence mean something other than what it says. I'll repeat it. Every scripture is inspired by God. Pretty simple. Peter says it in another way, in 2 Peter 1 verse 21, he said, no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So you've got Paul and Peter saying pretty much the same thing. The Bible is inspired. Fulfilled prophecy, historical accuracy, divine quality, all of these come together to say clearly that the Bible is completely and totally inspired by God. God breathed, given to man by God. Now some people may disagree and some may not believe and others may say that only certain parts of the Bible are inspired. But no one can deny that the Bible itself says that it is written by God. You understand what I'm saying? If I'm saying that to someone out there, they're allowed to say, well, you know what? I don't believe that. Okay. Or they may say, well, I don't accept that. Okay. They can say, I don't accept, I don't believe. That's fine. But one thing they cannot say is, the Bible does not say that about itself. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you read the Bible and you ask the Bible, hey Bible, what do you say about yourself? The Bible answers back, I say that I'm inspired by God. In 2 Timothy 3, in 1 Peter, and many other places. In the Old Testament, it's simply assumed. Okay? So, what does this mean for us in practical terms? Well, it means that regardless of the fads and social changes, we here remain a New Testament church committed to doing Bible things in Bible ways. That's not an outdated idea. That's not an idea or a, 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 an approach that grows old or wearisome. That's not a, a, a way to do things you know, that will be outdated and replaced by something else. That we, as a church, that we, the Choctaw Church of Christ, that we do Bible things in Bible ways, that's not going to change. It means that we don't add, we don't subtract, we don't change anything from the Bible, even if others do it, even if it would be more convenient to do it. 
You know, it'd be a lot more convenient to say, you know what? On the first day of spring, everybody who's believed in Jesus and repented of their sins will be baptized. We all know, on the first day of spring, whatever, you know, on the first day of spring and on the first day of fall, <laughs> we'll baptize everybody who wants to be baptized. That would be so much more convenient than calling Marty at two in the morning or someone else on a Saturday, or, you know, or we've had church all day and then we go home and you're in the middle of the meal and someone calls and says, you know, somebody heard something in class and they've decided you know, they want to be baptized. Whoops, drop the supper, you know, put the supper in the fridge, get your coat on, get back to the building, turn on the lights. That's the way we've always done it. And that's the way we will continue to do it in the future. It means that our basic commitment is to know and obey everything the Bible teaches and commands, whether it be by giving us a direct command or an inspired example or direction that leads us to some form of conclusion. That's the way we will come to our conclusions about what the Bible is teaching us. That the Bible is entirely God's word and we are to be guided by it and it alone this is a non-negotiable, not up for negotiation, not up for change. Because in this world, it is up for change. I mean, you have people who have church buildings and clergymen, pastors, who get up in front of their congregation and and, and explain to their congregation which parts of the Bible are written by man and which parts of the Bible are written by God. They get paid money to do that. What I'm saying to you tonight is that's not going to happen here. The inspiration, the complete inspiration of the Bible is a non-negotiable. Another basic teaching that many try to trade away for popularity or peace, but must remain a non-negotiable, is that salvation is in Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ. That's a non-negotiable. Again, some of you must be sitting there saying, oh man, alive, I, I came out in the rain to hear something new. I'm not hearing anything new. Well, yeah, I'm telling you, I'm telling you the old stuff reminding you about these things. Peter, the apostle, in referring to Jesus says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Acts chapter four, verse 12. Remember that passage, Acts chapter four, verse 12. Commit it to memory, put it in your mind, because that's where you're going to go when somebody says to you, where does it say in the Bible that you know, the Hindus are not going to be saved? Where does it say that in the Bible? Acts chapter four, verse 12. Case closed, argument over, next. This is not a popular idea. But Christianity is an exclusive religion. And we live in a society today that is bending itself over backwards to be inclusive. Everybody is welcome. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, what you think or what you believe, you can join the party. But you see, Christianity is not like that. The message is for everybody, yes. But the salvation is only for those who believe the message. So the Jews who rejected Jesus Christ then and today, yeah, they're not saved. And, and, and Muslims, with all the best peaceful interests in the whole wide world who reject Jesus Christ, yeah, they're not saved. And the Buddhists who are very much at peace with themselves and with the world and see Christ as only a teacher, 
and not a savior, yeah, they're not saved either. And the Hindus who reject Jesus, or actually they don't reject Him, He's just one more God. You know, just, uh, we got lots of gods, bring them on. One more is good. Yeah, they're not saved either. And the unbelievers and the undecided and the uh, 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 uncommitted and all those who have rejected Jesus Christ, who have said, you're not my Lord. You're not my Lord. Well, he says, okay, you're not my sheep. That's the way it works. That's the real world. That's the real world. And you know what? Somebody who's listening to this lesson, I think you know, we're among ourselves here tonight. There might be some visitors, some other brothers and sisters, but somebody who picks up this lesson and watches it on, on the website, it's going to go on the website. I'll get an angry email saying, who, you think you're the only ones who are saved? And I'll say, well, only the ones that believe in Jesus Christ and accept Him as the Savior, as the Son of God. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. Remember the other non-negotiable <laughs> that the Bible's inspired? Well, the inspired Bible says that Jesus Christ is the only way someone can be saved. So it doesn't take you know, a logistics genius to figure out that if you reject Christ, the only way you can be saved, then I guess you're not saved. I guess you're not saved then. Again, not a popular idea in this world of political correctness and relativity, where everyone is as good as everybody else, and so your religion is as good as somebody else's religion and your opinion, you know, people sometimes say, well, that's just your opinion. Yeah, it is just my opinion as to what I believe the Bible is saying. Yes, it is. But the day will come when we're going to find out whose opinion is correct. That day is going to come. The practical aspect of Jesus' message is very clear and you know what? It's very harsh. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. And those who disbelieve or who neglect to be baptized are not saved. That we need to believe in Jesus as the Son of God and confess His name, repent of our sins, be immersed in baptism in order to be saved, that's a non-negotiable. We don't negotiate that. We don't water that down. We don't fudge it. We don't go around it, under it, over it. You know? This has always been the only way of salvation and it will remain so until Jesus comes. And you'll have a lot of buddies who accept you as a religious person and will tolerate you until they ask you the question, so in your religion, you know, what, you know, tell me you know, in a nutshell, what is your religion? Uh, you just quote Acts chapter 4, verse 12, you find out how long you'll be buddies. Now I don't recommend we start there. I recommend we tell people the story you know, of Christ. I recommend that we explain the consequences and the ravages of sin on, on humanity. I suggest that we tell the gospel story that sending Jesus is an act of mercy, is an act of rescue. It's not a harsh, you know, you're lost and I don't care. It's a look, we're all drowning here and God has sent us a rescue and it's Him. I mean, you can speak the truth, but Speaking the truth in love means you emphasize the love of God in sending Jesus and not necessarily the idea that, well, if you don't like it, you're lost. That's not the point. <laughs> but eventually that question will come. I remember Lisa and I visiting uh, 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 some parents that were, uh, that their daughter was friends with Julia, our eldest daughter, and they were best buddies you know, in grade school. And so they said, oh, come on over for coffee. You know, we had coffee and the girls were there you know, running around and 
you know, sharing, and, and we were sharing and talking and so on and so forth, and they were you know, nice people, good people, non-religious people necessarily, you know, mainline Protestant, go to church you know, at Christmas, that type of thing. Oh, you're, and, and I knew it was coming, you know, I mean, I knew it was coming. And we had all the polite conversation, how are the Montreal Canadiens doing this year in hockey, and you know, and so we had all of that polite conversation. And then it's just, oh, you're a minister, right? Yeah, I'm a minister. So next question, you know what it is? So who, who, who do you preach for? You know, well, the Church of Christ, the Church of Christ. Then the next question, always, how big is that church like that, you know, somehow relates to the credibility of your message, but anyways. And he said, he just came out, you know, he's going to be a smart guy, you know, and he said, well, said, so, so according to you, he said, uh, are Hindus going to heaven? And I said, uh, no. <laughs> and he looked at me, then he looked at his wife and he said, well, well, what about Muslims? I said, well, no. And then he was like in a, it was preposterous, you know what I'm saying? He was like he had entered the twilight zone. And he says, you don't mean to say, you don't mean to, are you telling me here and now, are you saying to me here and now that if somebody doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, you know, like they're not going to heaven? I said, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches. Acts 4.12. <laughs> Talk about awkward. The girls wanted to keep playing, but it was like, uh, you know, well, I think we need to go, you know. And they said, sure, let me get your coat. Somebody may say to you, oh, you're the guys that don't you know, use the instrument. And yes, you know, and it takes a while to explain that. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and we try to kind of show them that you know, this is the way, and you know, if, you're, if, if you follow the scriptures as far as public worship is concerned, you know, I'm not telling you that if, you're, you know, uh, you're, if you happen to have a piano in your church building, because of that reason, all of you going to hell. You know, I, but that salvation is only through Christ, oh, yeah, that's a non-negotiable, sorry. You know, can't change that one. Even not to hurt your feelings or to wreck this nice dinner you've made for us, sorry. You know, can't, no, can't do that. And then there's another non-negotiable, and that is, uh, that I want to talk about tonight anyways, that is, there is only one true church. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. Notice I picked scriptures that are pretty clear. Matthew 16, 18. Notice he didn't say, uh, upon, this, uh, upon this rock I will build a church, some church. He said, my church. He didn't say my churches or one of many churches. He said my church, singular, one church. Paul the Apostle said there is one body and one spirit. Ephesians, excuse me, 4 verse 4. So Paul and the other apostles described the church that belonged to Jesus. They worked to establish that one body of which Christ was the head. And some say that the church of Christ, you know, they think they're the only ones. And I correct them when they say that to me. I say, we don't say that about ourselves. What we say is that the Bible describes only one church and we are doing everything we can do to be that one church. So far as it is in our power to understand, so far as it is in our spirit to obey, so far as it is in our, in our understanding to do the right thing and to do the way God wants, you know, with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul and all our strength, you know, we're trying to do what He's told us to do as far as being the church is concerned. That's our target. It's for this reason that we don't approve of groups who call themselves churches but don't follow the New Testament in their teaching or in their practice. Or religious organizations that try to replace the church. Nor do we support or encourage movements to unify various denominations at the expense of 
Bible teaching, oh, that troublesome first non-negotiable, the inspiration of scripture. It's such a troublesome thing. If we didn't believe that, we could do all kinds of things. So all of these have sincere motives. You know, they, they want to proclaim Christ, they want to do good, but they're going about it in the wrong way using man-made methods and organizations, man-made rules. The reason that the churches of Christ were at one time the fastest growing religious, you know, Christian religious group, was the very fact that we were the ones saying, let's just do Bible things in Bible ways. And that caught the spirit of America. People had been trapped in these old world religions where the government and the, and, and, and the church were kind of, had this nasty relationship and they lorded it over people. And people came to this country and said, enough. And Campbell and others said, hey, we got, we got a bright idea. Why don't we just do what the Bible says? <laughs> Why don't we just do what the Bible says? We don't need some big poopa you know, telling us that we're allowed to do this or allowed to do that. The Bible gives us all the authority we need to preach Christ, to baptize people, to form churches, to do good, to proclaim the kingdom. We don't need anybody's permission. And that idea, wow, that had, man, that had legs, that idea. When it comes to Christianity, the end does not justify the means. Anything not organized and operated according to the New Testament is not the church, regardless of its size, motives, or splendor. We associate with all kinds of people, good and bad. Some we associate with to encourage their good works. You know, uh, uh, you know I'll send money to the you know, Oklahoma, the mission, you know, where they feed the homeless people. You know. They're not the church, but they're doing a good thing. And I'll support that, I think that's a good thing. And others we associate with to, to win their souls. People who don't believe, people who have got you know, serious issues, but we wade into their lives to try to help them, to, to have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. You know? But we only have fellowship with those who are actually in the body of Christ. I have friends and I have associates and I have family members who are of various religions and moral backgrounds and I love them and I care about them, but my only brothers and sisters in Christ are in the Lord's church. As I've said to you many times, I loved my mother and I had a relationship with my mother, but I never had fellowship with my mother. That was a sad thing for me. I never had fellowship with her. I think you understand what I'm saying. Fellowship is a non-negotiable thing. As I said at the beginning, there are many non-negotiables in the Bible. The need to live holy lives, that's a non-negotiable. That faith without works is dead, yeah. That without love, our religion is vain. That we need to remain faithful to Christ until the end in order to be with Him at the beginning of eternity. And you can add yours right here to the list. But all of these other non-negotiables are taught and supported in one way or another by the elemental three that I mentioned this evening. Remember I said you know, that, 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 that pesky, inspiration thing gets in the way of so many other things we'd like to be able to do, but we can't get past that number one non-negotiable. Now the problem with non-negotiables is that they are hard to accept. They limit us, they draw a line across which we cannot pass. And you know what? Some people, some very smart people, some very religious people, even those people, they don't like to be told what to do, and some of them don't even like to be told what to do to be told what to do by God Himself. 
For some people this idea of non-negotiable is frustrating and it's challenging spiritually. If you feel that you are one of these people, let me help you accept this difficult lesson tonight, because it is a difficult lesson. Let me, let me give you something that'll help you with the non-negotiables. Number one, learn to accept the non-negotiables. Fighting the true biblical non-negotiables is a sign of spiritual pride. You can't grow in grace and peace until you accept the limits that God places on you. Remember, the non-negotiables are put there by God, not man. They're not just Church of Christ traditions, that the Bible is inspired. We didn't invent that idea in the Church of Christ, that we can only be saved through Christ. That's not something we came up with. And so learn to accept the non-negotiables. They're there. Try to remember, He's God, okay, up there, and we're <laughs> the created ones, the sinful, weak, you know, that's who we are. Secondly, it'll help accept these things if you realize that at Choctaw Church of Christ, the non-negotiables are truly non-negotiable. We all need to know that the leadership of this church is not about to change the things that the Bible has clearly set forth. So if you're a person that longs for the day, you know, secretly in your soul, you long for the day when we don't emphasize the preaching and teaching of the Bible as God's only inspired word. If you're anxious uh, that we back off on telling the world that those who are not baptized into Christ are lost forever. If that makes you squeamish, or if you hope the day will come that the Church of Christ will become more and more like the, denomina uh, the denominational churches around us, you're in for a long, frustrating wait. These things will not be preached or promoted on my watch or Marty's watch, I don't usually speak for Marty, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure. And they will not be supported while the present eldership is in place. You'd have to get rid of all the elders you know, to have any of the thing. To have any of the non-negotiables tossed aside, you'd have to get rid of the entire eldership. And one more word of advice on the subject. Try to understand that steady, doesn't mean stagnant. We want to persevere in the doing of good as well as maintain God's word exactly as it is. These things are not mutually exclusive. We can do good, we can help the poor, we can reach out, we can start support, we can do all of those things without violating the non-negotiables. So don't confuse this with simply maintaining the status quo or being stagnant. We maintain that the Bible is inspired, but we teach it with all the tools that modern technology will provide us with. I mean, that's what we taught last week, right? Bible talk, I mean. The latest technology is what we're using to get the word out. To get Acts 4.12 out into the world, we're using the internet. We hold to the New Testament pattern of worship but that doesn't mean we can't introduce new songs or use TVs and overheads or plan our worship around themes, get everybody involved in the experiencing of, uh, the experiencing of, 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 of uh, worship. However, we won't change the Bible to change the way we do Bible things so we can communicate effectively to our society and our age. You understand what I'm saying? We're not going to you know, get rid of the non-negotiables so that we can reach the under 40 crowd. Or the high tech crowd, or the rich crowd, or the, you know. We're not going to do that. Let's not be fooled into thinking that change, especially unbiblical change, will improve worship or evangelism. On the other hand, let's not hide behind the excuse of protecting doctrine when all we want to do is stay in our little comfort zone. So my purpose is not to you know, discourage or to offend anybody tonight. 
My purpose on the contrary is to encourage and reassure everyone that we are and plan to remain a New Testament church and we plan to maintain all of the non-negotiables, even those that haven't been mentioned here. Somebody said to me, why do you stay with the Church of Christ? A lot bigger churches, you know, blah, blah, blah. I stay with the Church of Christ because we have the right idea. We're shooting at the right target. We don't always hit it. We don't always hit it, but we're aiming at the right thing. The only thing I want to discourage is the attempt by anyone to change these basic truths, now and forever. I want to be on the record. In, doing, or in closing, rather, I remind you once again of one of those non-negotiable items and I offer you an opportunity to respond. For those who have non-negotiable sins, <laughs> there's another non-negotiable. You sin, you die. That's another non-negotiable. If you disobey God's laws, you lose your soul. That's a non-negotiable. If you have that, if you have that in your life, here's a great offer. Jesus says that those who believe and are baptized will have all of their sins washed away forever. You know, let's flip it on its positive side. Think of what we gain in salvation. Think of what God is offering us in salvation. And John says that those who confess their sins will be restored, 1 John chapter one, I'm kind of paraphrasing there. So these are non-negotiable promises. If you believe in Christ and if you obey Him, He promises you that all of your sins will be forgiven. He promises you that He will bring you to heaven with Him. He promises you it's a non-negotiable thing. So if you need to be saved, if you need to be restored, if you need the prayers of the church, we encourage you to come forward now and avail yourself of the non-negotiable promises that God has given each one of us as Bob uh, comes up and leads us in, a, in his song. Shall we stand for this uh, invitation song, please?